Great. Good morning and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. And we are continuing working on uh, S-119 regarding use of force. And then later in the day, we'll look at the miscellaneous judiciary bill, which has a number of different uh, components to it, but we'll be focusing on uh, DLS and then cannabis expungement. Uh, but right now we're going to start with, uh, with attorney Bryn Hare. Welcome. And uh, I asked Bryn to, to do a, a walkthrough again of S-119. I know we did it yesterday, but it was, it was quick. It was a large group. And I just thought it would be uh, helpful uh, to have her do it again. And that way uh, we can ask questions. Um, I see Martin's hand. And so, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm wondering if it just makes sense for me to give context before the walkthrough or was, after the yeah, walkthrough. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. As yes. So I, I would like Martin as um, sponsor and, and person who worked um, very hard on on this amendment. Um, yeah. Why? 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 That would be helpful. What? What problem are we? What Vermont problem are we trying to solve? Uh, and and how does that um, attempt to do this? I think that'd be be very helpful. Thank sure. you. Um, <clears throat> essentially, the, the problem is uh, accountability that we're trying to solve. But, but let me give a little bit of background uh, and, a, and a basic premise uh, that the state in the first instance uh, created uh, the law enforcement agencies, gave law enforcement agencies certain duties. Uh, and these duties can be categorized as um, effectuating the adjudicative process, that means serving serving warrants, you know, serving process, et cetera, searches, and, and maintaining uh, public order. And, and I could go over and maybe some other point, or I, I could provide the several different uh, provisions throughout uh, Title 24 and Title 20 uh, that create those duties for sheriffs, for police, uh, local police agencies, and for state police, but uh, I'll just move on for, for now, but uh, make it um, the, the short, uh, point is that uh, the state has created police uh, and has given it the authority to use to use force. Um, so it, it seems to be that it should be the state's responsibility to perhaps put some sideboards on that use of force as opposed to leaving it entirely up to uh, the law enforcement agencies to essentially police them themselves. Uh, and in fact, uh, the legislature at one point did uh, put some sideboards on, and that's that's found in uh, 13 VSA 2305. They they kind of put some guardrails on. Uh, that's the legislature. Uh, the uh, that's the law uh, related to justifiable homicide, and essentially states that a law enforcement officer will be guiltless if he or she kills or wounds someone. Uh, and I'll you know, quote, when lawfully called out to suppress riot or rebellion or to prevent or suppress invasion or to assist in serving legal process in suppressing opposition against him or her in the just and necessary discharge of his or her duty. Doesn't talk anything about self-defense, doesn't talk anything about risk of death, et cetera. Uh, bottom line is it's in dire need of updating as far as what kind of uh, guardrails uh, the legislature is putting on the force that we have bestowed upon law enforcement. Um, and, and, and actually that law is probably unconstitutional under current, uh, if somebody tried to uh, justify lethal force because they were serving process uh, and didn't face any kind of threat of death, that would probably be held to be unconstitutional. So, Really, the idea here is to, I think, fulfill the legislative responsibility uh, to have some accountability related to the force uh, that we have sanctioned uh, for law enforcement to use uh, for important, important um, uh, activities, uh, important duties, uh, including uh, maintaining public order, but nevertheless, uh, that there should be some sideboards. Uh, you know, one might uh, assert uh, that, well, we should leave it to policy. We have lots of uh, law enforcement agencies uh, that have policy uh, related to use of force. Uh, but policy is not enforceable. Uh, it's, it's uh, in fact, very clearly, it's kind of interesting. 
that in the training manual, which I've had a chance to look at, um, the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council Manual for Training on Use of Force says, generally speaking, and I'm going to quote, generally speaking, a violation of a department policy can result in sanctions or punishments from your department. And if the clause of the policy that is violated mirrors the law, it can also result in criminal charges or lawsuits. Uh, the accountability is at the local agency and the accountability across the state with many different agencies uh, can be inconsistent. Uh, and I think the best way to get to a, a consistent accountability uh, and guideposts for uh, exercise of force, including uh, deadly force, <clears throat> is to have the statute uh, set forth those standards. So okay. that, that's, that's where this comes from. Great. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Martin at this point before we uh, turn to Bryn? Not seeing any. Okay, great. Thank you, Martin. Bryn, thank you. Good morning. Right. Yep, good morning. <laughs> good morning, committee. Uh, for the record, Bryn Hare from Legislative Council. Um, so I know that we, yesterday morning, we did a sort of a blast walkthrough of the amendment uh, to S-119, but um, I was asked to do another one this morning so there'd be more time for questions. So I'm going to, again, walk through the side-by-side -side amendment um, because I think that's helpful to um, see how the, how the amendment differs from the Senate version. And also, I, since I did that yesterday, I know people may have taken notes on that version. So if everybody has the side-by-side, -side, I'll get started with the walkthrough. And again, I'll just point out that um, one of the major differences between this amendment and the Senate version is that the changes to this amendment make it clear that this, these are um, what, what this bill does is it sets forth standards for the use of force generally, not just the use of deadly force by law enforcement. So we've changed the title of the bill there at the top. And in section one, you can see that the section name for this new section of law in Title 20 is changed to standards for law enforcement use of force. Um, to make it clear that these are really legal standards and not necessarily uh, an entire policy because um, that could be fleshed out much more by um, the Criminal Justice Training Council or the agencies and the departments themselves. So the definition section starts with deadly force, um, any use of force that creates a substantial risk of death or serious bodily injury. That's pretty straightforward. Um, the next definition is imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury. Um, and I should probably preface this by saying, I think that this committee has heard this several times now. Um, S-119 is really based on um, the California statute that passed. Um, it took effect last January um, regarding the poli police use of force. Um, so that this language comes from that, um, from that bill. And this definition applies to the use of deadly force section of the, of the standards, which we'll get to in subsection C. So that definition means that um, when, based on the totality of the circumstances, which is another defined term that we'll get to soon, a reasonable officer in the same situation would believe that a person has the present ability, opportunity, and apparent intent to immediately cause injury, um, serious bodily injury or death to either the law enforcement officer or to another person. And an imminent harm isn't merely a fear of future harm, no matter how great that fear and no matter how great the likelihood of harm, but is one that from all appearances must be instantly confronted and addressed. Definition of law enforcement officer, that's a um, definition from Title 20 from the Criminal Justice Training Council chapter. Prohibited restraint is the next definition and this is the same um, this term is defined the same way as it's defined in the new crime that um, was passed in S-219. So that should look familiar to you. Um, subdivision five is totality of the circumstances. So this definition um, has changed pretty substantially from the Senate version. So um, the first part of the definition is, is the same, means all facts known to the law enforcement officer at the time, including the words and conduct of the subject and the conduct and decisions of the officer that lead up to the use of deadly force. So we've just added that word and decisions. But then we set out um, several different factors that are to be considered in making an analysis of the totality of the circumstances. 
Um, and again, I said this yesterday, many of these come from the Seattle use of force policy. Some of them, um, some of them don't, but many of them do. So consideration of the following factors. A is seriousness of the crime or the suspected offense. B is the conduct of the subject being confronted as reasonably perceived by the officer at the time. And that is to include the following two additional factors, signs of intoxication, impairment, or disordered thought that are related to the use or consumption of alcohol or other controlled substances, or signs that the subject is suffering the effects of a mental disease or defect, or has a physical disability that impairs the subject's ability to understand or comply with law enforcement commands. Subdivision C, I'm at the bottom of page three now. Um, another factor to consider when evaluating the totality of the circumstances is the time available to the officer to make a decision. D is the availability of other resources, including non-lethal means to gain compliance of the subject. E sets out factors regarding the physical characteristics of the officer and the subject to include the age, size, and relative strength of both individuals, the skill level and training of the officer, and whether the officer or the subject are injured or exhausted at the time. And then lastly, subdivision F is environmental factors and any exigent circumstances. So again, that is the long list of factors um, that are to be considered in an analysis of what constitutes the totality of the circumstances. Okay, I'm gonna move on then. So subsection B, now we're getting into the actual standards themselves. Could I actually, I'm so sorry, Bryn, I'm just yeah. to press all the buttons in time to like a question, but um, I know there was a, would you mind just giving a little more detail and interpretation on um, uh, subdivision F here. I know there were some questions about that and like how far reaching that would be yesterday. And I thought for me, at least it would be helpful to hear your take on that one more time. While I'm here. So um, I described subsection F yesterday, um, environmental factors and any exigent circumstances as kind of being a catch all. Um, that's the way I read that language. Again, it's modified by the by the definition as it as it is presented in subdivision um, subdivision five. So I'm back on page two now. So any um, exigent circumstances or environmental factors that are um, known to the law enforcement officer at the time. So um, I see that as being um, pretty broad language that would that could en encompass um, a variety of factors as long as um, it was a fact that was known to the law enforcement officer. Um, but, but an argument that like anything and everything could be taken into account, including things that the officer couldn't have known about at the time or was unaware of at the time, wouldn't, wouldn't hold um, against this provision, it sounds like. No, I do think that it's clear that it has to be known to the officer or by the officer. So I think that the um, uh, and environmental factors could be anything from like the weather, what's happening if, if it's if it's a if it's dark out or if it's um, pouring rain or something like that. And any exigent circumstances I see as being any any sort of um, pressing or urgent uh, environmental factors that exist at the time. Um, that are known by the law enforcement officer. Is that, am I answering your question? Yeah, that's really helpful clarification just to be reminded that that, that there, this is conditioned to a degree. Yeah. I appreciate mm -hmm. that. Yeah, Martin. Yeah, and would it be fair to say, Bryn, that I, that the environmental factors, exigent circumstances would have to be relevant to the use of force or what the officers uh, decisions or conduct was presumably right. Yeah, I mean, I think that sort of well, the totality of the circumstances is describing the scenario that the use of force happened under. Um, and I do think, depending on it's such a, it's obviously such a factually um, specific inquiry um, that depending on the situation, a variety of factors may be relevant to the decision. Of the officer, or maybe relevant to the inquiry on what of whether or not it was reasonable to use that level of force. 
Um, and so I agree that it is kind of broad language, but um, again, a variety of factors may, may be relevant depending on the specific set of facts. And uh, Bryn, do we have case law? Is, is there established case law um, from Seattle or, or elsewhere? Um, or would this all be all new territory? No, I, there, I mean, there is, there is relevant case law um, about the reasonableness standard, um, which is essentially mod the totality of the circumstances modifies the reasonableness standard. So we're going to see the word reasonable throughout the standards in the bill, and it's always modified by the totality of the circumstances. And that is true in existing case law, certainly. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna I'll move on um, to subsection B, the use of force standards. So again, these are um, these set forth the standards for law enforcement use of force generally, not necessarily deadly force. So subdivision one on page four, this is the same language um, that's in the Senate version, sort of a general statement that the use of force. Um, the authority to use physical force is a serious responsibility that should be exercised judiciously. Um, subdivision two on page five, this sets out sort of um, that I see this is really being the meat of the standard for the use of force by law enforcement. And you can see this language is a little bit different um, than the Senate version. So law is provides that law enforcement shall only use the force that's objectively reasonable necessary and proportional. Those are the three important words and we're gonna to get to those um, as we go through this section. To effect an arrest, to prevent escape or to overcome resistance of a person that the officer has reasonable cause to believe has committed a crime while protecting the life and safety of all persons. So um, some of this language does come from the Senate version just in a different section. Um, so, um, so it's not entirely different from the Senate language. Not our see your hand is up. Yes, thank you. I just had a quick question about the uh, the last part of this, where it's talking about the officer has reasonable cause to believe um, has committed a crime while protecting the life and safety of all persons. If an officer encounters somebody who hasn't necessarily committed a crime but is posing a threat to the life and safety of all of anyone. Um, how, how would that be impacted by this? Like I'm, I'm thinking of somebody who may be suicidal and they have a gun, but they have at that point have not technically committed a crime. Um, is force still usable in any degree? Well, there, the standards um, include some language about uh, law enforcement not having the authority to use force um, on a person who only presents a risk of harm to themselves and the officer reasonably believes that there is not a risk to, of harm to the officer or to another person. So in that specific scenario, I think there's another portion of the bill that addresses that specific okay. set of circumstances. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna carry on um, unless I see anyone else, okay. So um, subsection three at the bottom of page five, Again, this is a little bit of a general statement that decisions um, by law enforcement to use force have to be made carefully and thought and thoroughly in a manner that reflects, that reflects the gravity of that authority and the serious consequences of the use of force <clears throat> in order to ensure that officers use force consistent with law and agency policies. That's a bit of a general statement. The next subsection, subsection four, um, Four, five, and six now talk about those words that I highlighted in subsection two. So section, subsection four on page six, um, this talks about what that reasonable word means. So whether the decision by law enforcement to use force was objectively reasonable shall be evaluated from the perspective of a reasonable officer in the same situation based on the totality of the circumstances. So there's that language together, um, like I said before, that definition of totality of the circumstances, that long list of factors modifies what it means um, to, to be objectively reasonable, whether or not it was a reasonable decision to use force. Um, so I'm gonna pop down to subsection five now. 
This is um, describing what the word necessary means in context of the standard for use of force. So force is necessary if no reasonable, um, no reasonably effective alternative to, to the use of force appears to exist to the officer and the amount of force used is reasonable to affect the lawful purpose intended. And whether using force is necessary, again, is based on the totality of the circumstances at the time of the use of force. And that language comes from the Seattle policy on use of force. And so does the next um, subsection six, describing what the word proportional means. So force is proportional if the level of force applied reflects the totality of the circumstances, including the nature and immediacy of any threats to the officer or to others. And um, there's also a specific statement here that the proportional force doesn't require an officer to be using the same amount of force or the same type of force that's used by the subject. And then the, the next sentence is sort of a general statement that encompasses all three of those words, um, reasonable, necessary, and proportional. The more immediate the threat and the more likely that the threat will result in death or serious bodily injury. So like the more serious the threat, the greater level of force may be proportional necessary and objectively reasonable to counter. Okay, so I'm gonna move down to sub, subsection seven here. Prior to using force, um, this is language that kind of describes the proactive steps that law enforcement need to take prior to the use of force. Um, so prior, and it describes de-escalation tactics essentially. Prior to using force, law enforcement officer shall, if, if feasible, take the following proactive steps to stabilize the situation so that more time, options, and resources are available to gain a person's voluntary compliance and reduce or eliminate the need to use force. And that can include verbal persuasion, warnings, tactical techniques, slowing down the pace of an incident, waiting out a subject, creating distance between the officer and the threat, and requesting additional resources to resolve the incident. So it sets forth some specific um, de-escalation de tactics that an officer can use prior to the use of force, if feasible for the officer. So I'll move on to subdivision or subsection C here, which now we're getting into the standards for the use of deadly force by law enforcement. Um, so subdivision one says that law enforcement is justified in using deadly force only when, based on the totality of the circumstances, such force is objectively reasonable and necessary to achieve one of the following two objectives. Subsection A, to defend against an imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury to the officer or to another person. Or the other set of circumstances, um, which would, uh, an officer would be justified in using deadly force, are to apprehend a fleeing person for any felony that threatened or, result, or resulted in death or serious bodily injury if it's modified by the next clause, if the officer reasonably believes that the person will cause death or serious bodily injury if they're not immediately apprehended. So that's um, that subdivision one and those two sub following subsections is really the, um, the crux of the use of deadly force standard here. And it really provides that um, law enforcement may only use uh, deadly force if it's necessary to defend um, human life. So I'm gonna move down to subdivision two. Um, I'm on the bottom of page nine now. This language doesn't appear in the Senate version and this is language that describes what the word necessary means. Ran, uh, I ha can I ask, an, I'm so context. sorry to keep interrupting, but could I ask a question about that section we just moved through? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, sorry, I'm having some connectivity issues. So just let me know if, you're, if you lose me. Um, so to Nader's question, I mean, here it's saying the use of, we've sort of, it sounds like we've said use of force that we, we address later in the bill that use of force cannot be used if the only harm is to, um, uh, that the, is, sorry, that a person is only at risk of harming themselves. But here it says, um, that 
deadly force can be used to prevent death or serious bodily injury to the officer or another person, which I think would potentially, I'm just wondering if we need to, if that's at odds at all with um, the provision you talked about in response to Nader's question, or if, if it's really clear that it's talking about someone other than the subject of Um, so, you, of course, does it, is my question making any sense at all? Yes, yes, and I should and I should be clear that the w my response um, to the earlier question was um, I should have made it clear that that provision is in subsection C, which has to do with the use of deadly force by law enforcement. So we haven't gotten to that provision yet. It's subdivision five on page ten, and it specifically says that law enforcement shall not use deadly force against a person based on the um, danger that person poses to themselves, as long as the officer reasonably believes that they do not present a, a danger to the officer or to another person. So reading that language in connection with um, C1, A and B, I would see, I would read the word another person to mean a different person, not the person, not the subject um, against whom law enforcement is using force. I'm going to move on if that's okay. I'll keep going. <clears throat> so subdivision, now I'm on subdivision three at the top of page 10. This is also new um, language that doesn't appear in the Senate version and I also comes from the Seattle policy. And it provides that law enforcement have to stop using deadly force against a person as soon as that um, person surrenders or that force um, is no longer necessary to uh, prevent against an imminent danger of death or serious bodily injury to the officer or to another Brent, person. I'm sorry, Brent, did you do B, did you do a subsection two or maybe I zoned out uh, the uh, regarding oh, necessary? No, I skipped it. I'm sorry. Okay. That's, All right. that's important. That's important. Sorry. I'll go back. Oh, no problem. <laughs> so bottom of page nine, sub subdivision two there, I think I started out saying that this um, subdivision provides a description of what the word necessary means in context of the standard for the use of deadly force. So it says use of deadly force is necessary when given the totality of the circumstances, an objectively reasonable officer in the same situation would conclude that there was no reasonable alternative to the use of deadly force that would prevent um, death or serious bodily injury to the officer or to another person. And then we again have um, some language in there saying when feasible, officers shall employ all other reasonable means before resorting to the use of deadly force. Okay, so I'm gonna skip subsection three on page 10 since we talked about that. Um, sub, subsection four, this is the same language that appears in the Senate version of the bill officer has to make reasonable efforts to identify themselves and warn that deadly force may be used if feasible. Subdivision five, law, and here's that language about law enforcement officers shall not use deadly force against a person who only poses a danger to themselves and not to the officer or to another person. Subdivision six, I'm on page 11 now. Um, and this is, the, this is essentially the language that provides that um, law enforcement doesn't lose um, the right to self-defense. So officer who makes or attempts to make an arrest doesn't have to retreat or desist from their efforts um, because the person resists or threatens to resist. Um, and a law enforcement shall not be deemed the aggressor or lose that right to self-defense by the use of proportional force if necessary in compliance with B2, that's the standard set for law enforcement use of force generally. And, and it also provides that retreat doesn't necessarily mean, doesn't mean tactical repositioning or other de-escalation tactics. So I'm gonna move on to subdivision seven. I'm at the top of page 12 now. And this is the section that deals with prohibited restraint. Um, so the Senate version provides that law enforcement shall not use a prohibited restraint for any reason. And this version provides that law enforcement may use a prohibited restraint, but only in a situation where the use of deadly force is justified 
and if no other intervention is, is available to defend against an imminent threat of serious bodily injury or death to the officer or to another person. And also provides that law enforcement is not justified in continuing to use a prohibited restraint when there's no longer an objectively reasonable belief that the subject poses, continues to pose immediate threat of death or serious bodily injury to the officer or to another person. Tom. Thank you. Um, in in uh, seven that you just went through, Bryn, it says uh, may use a prohibited restraint in certain situations. Well, doesn't that make that not a prohibited restraint? And maybe some other language could be used there. So um, the, we've de you've defined prohibited restraint in a couple of places now. Um, in S219, you define prohibited restraint in um, the unprofessional conduct chapter um, for law enforcement. And it's also defined in the new crime that passed in S219. So because it's the exact same definition, we've used the same term here. And um, I'm not sure if you would like to change the, change the name. That's up to you guys. Yeah, you, uh, you were you were breaking up a little bit. I didn't I didn't get the oh, last sorry. probably 10, 15 seconds. So <laughs> that's not helpful. Um, so <laughs> what I said was we have <laughs> we have defined the term in a couple of other places now. It's the same definition with the same words, prohibited restraint. So if you wanted to change that um, name, I think that it would make sense to change it also in the other places where you've defined it. In Title 13 and Title 20. Okay, thank you. Great. Uh, Martin. So, I mean, on, on that, that issue, I've always kind of thought of the concept of prohibited restraint is that if you're using that particular maneuver, chokehold, whatever you want to call it, to restrain somebody, that's a little bit different issue than if you're uh, scuffling on the ground with somebody in a knife and can't reach your gun and your life is uh, being threatened, uh, that that's not really even a, a restraint at that moment. It's a self-defense action. So it's a little confusing that that it's called prohibited restraint there, but, but I think it still kind of works. Does that make sense? Well, I, I can understand that it still works because of uh, what we can do with definitions. I mean, we can do anything we want with definition. Just, it's just that the, the negative connotation. I mean, if, if, if something did happen, especially in this day and age, if something did happen and uh, it could be reported or, uh, you know, in a report that they used a prohibited restraint, what, I mean, what's that going to do as far as, uh, you know, the, the unknowing public goes and that type of thing. It, it's just, to me, just the negative connotations of it uh, now, uh, um, I think it needs to be changed. I mean, I guess uh, maybe some more uh, discussion on it a, a little later when we, you know, when we're, we're not going through this, but um, yeah, it, it, in, in the definition, in, in, in the public's eyes, it's a prohibited restraint, period. And I don't know if, if, if we do have that situation, if, if we need to, to stir that up, so. Right, gotcha. Bryn, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, um, so subdivision eight uh, is the same language that appears in the Senate version, subdivision five, um, that requires that law enforcement do have a duty to intervene if they observe another officer using a prohibited restraint on a person. Um, so I'm going to move on to subsec or to section two of the bill now. So um, the following sections don't appear in the Senate bill. Um, these are additional sections. So um, what section two does, it, this is a little strange because I know you've, you passed this language in 219, but what, because it hasn't taken effect yet, we have to do something a little tricky, which is you just have to essentially pass it again with the amendment you want to make. And then we repeal the version that passed in 219. So you'll see that the bill does that as well. So this is the new crime 
It's um, identical to the new prime as it passed in 219, except for one very important caveat, which you can find on page 14. I should have highlighted it, but I didn't. In subsection B, it provides that a law enforcement officer acting in the officer's capacity as law enforcement who employs a prohibited restraint on a person in a manner inconsistent with section 2368C7. And that's the language that we just went through. So that in a manner inconsistent with doesn't appear in the 219 version of this new crime. So that's the that's what that's what's added in S119 here. So only if the prohibited restraint is employed in a manner that's inconsistent with that standard that's set forth in C7 that we just went through for an officer to use a prohibited restraint <clears throat> that and the prohibited restraint causes death or serious bodily injury. That would be the only time that a law enforcement officer would be able to be charged under this um, under this new crime. Is that clear? So essentially it provides that it's no longer prohibited under, under all circumstances. Um, it is a person couldn't, a law enforcement officer couldn't be prosecuted for using a prohibited restraint unless it was um, directly inconsistent with the standards that are set forth by the new um, standards for use of deadly force by law enforcement. And it caused death or serious bodily injury to the person. Uh, Barbara. Thanks. So Brent, I actually got a interesting question from a constituent um, who is, uh, well, it doesn't matter her background, but um, so she asked me about the types of bodily actions that shall not be used um, and said that it seemed troubling because it was too broad and yet too narrow. And she said, if there's a physical struggle between an officer and a suspect, <clears throat> if one of these listed items occurs inadvertently in the midst of the struggle, um, she would think that would be okay, particularly if it was momentary and inadvertent. But on the other hand, there are things that aren't listed that can be just as bad, such as kneeling on someone's chest or back that prevents them from breathing or interferes with cardiac function. And she wondered if we should focus on prohibited results, such as prohibiting um, prolonged or intentional interference with breathing or other bodily functions, which I thought was interesting. <laughs> um, so I think that under the, so I'm, I'm not sure that the definition of prohibited restraint would not include kneeling on a person's back, um, since that is a maneuver that could that may prevent or hinder breathing, reduce the intake of air, or impede the flow of blood or oxygen to the brain. Um, so I'm not sure that that wouldn't be included. Okay. Um, so you feel like it is broad enough that it would cover something we didn't think of if there's some move that would impede breathing. But I do. I mean, I do. I, you, you, you all worked on this definition, and I think that your intent was really yeah. to include any any type of maneuver that is potentially lethal for those reasons by impeding the flow of blood or oxygen to the brain or reducing the intake of air. Um, I think okay. that was the intent behind that that language. Thank you. It's hard to remember. The, and I had one other question from the very beginning definitions when you said. Um, let me just see, I wrote it down. Um, uh, so that all facts known. So I'm wondering if it should be known or should have known. Um, yeah, so that, I think that that would change the standard. Um, that would be a, sort of an additional inquiry. I think you would be creating kind of an additional inquiry into whether an officer should have known something, um, but didn't. <clears throat> and that may modify the reasonable officer inquiry, um, whether or not it was reasonable um, that the officer knew or okay. did not know. Something. Thank you. So follow up to that question. Uh, so <clears throat> current law, uh, case law and such, they look at just the facts actually known or do they look at the facts that should have been known by a reasonable law enforcement officer? 
Um, so I would have to, I would have to revisit some case law. My recollection is that it really talks about what facts were known to the officer at the time. Um, but I would need to revisit it to find out if they also talk about what should have been known. Yeah, I mean, if, it, if it's consistent with the current state of the law, I mean, we are pushing it in other areas, just to make it clear. We, I think, are pushing what uh, case law is as far as defining necessity and a couple of the other things we're doing, but uh, that one definitely is worth, I think, looking into. And if the case law is should have been known, uh, then we should seriously consider that. But if it's not, since we're pushed, yeah, that would be a pretty big push beyond current case law if that's not already uh, looked at. So uh, I'll look yeah, into that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Tom. Yeah, Martin, you were just talking, I didn't quite understand what you were saying about, um, I, I guess what I heard is you say, and, and not put in, trying to put words in your mouth, but um, I thought I heard you say something that almost is like pushing the limits on something or no, you, you said pushing and if, if you could uh, uh, kind of go back over what you were talking about. Well, well, I think overall what the policy does uh, is, let me make clear, it's consistent certainly with what uh, police agencies, at least the ones that are doing it right, are following as policy. But if you look at Supreme Court precedent in the context that these cases come up, which is usually actually civil actions under what's called Section 1983, which is the federal law that you can bring against state actors for violating constitutional uh, rights, such as uh, Fourth Amendment in, in these cases. So that area of law, uh, I would say, is, is more restrictive than what we're putting in as standards in this bill. But as far as what law enforcement is actually doing under policies, it's, it's very consistent. I don't know if that helps. Yes. It's just, yeah. So, yeah, it, but, but it, it, I would like to understand from that other area of law, the Supreme Court precedent and such, uh, the concept of uh, known or should have known, because we are looking to that law as well. That law kind of sets, I would say, a base. Law enforcement agencies have gone beyond that base. This would go beyond that as well. Did I just... Okay. Use it, or did I? <laughs> no, no, no. You, you didn't confuse me any more than I, no. That that was great. Thank you. Right. And if I said anything wrong, Bryn will correct me. Okay. No, nope, that sounded right to me. So, as I said earlier, I will look into that question and get back to the committee. <clears throat> okay. Great. We just have a few more minutes for for to wrap up uh martin i don't think did you talk about the repeal or did i miss that bit no i haven't gotten to that section yet oh, we're not done yet just got two more sections which is the repeals and the effective date um so section three this is at on page 14 um this the act to, uh, or the the bill makes two repeals the first is um that subdivision three of the justifiable homicide statute which representative lalonde was talking about earlier it just repeals um, the section of the statute <clears throat> that provides that um, essentially a, a law enforcement officer is justified in um, killing or wounding a person um, when they're lawfully called out to suppress a riot or rebellion, to prevent or suppress invasion, or to assist in serving legal process, or in suppressing opposition against him or her in the just and necessary discharge of his or her duty. So um, Representative Lulong kind of covered that earlier in his introduction um, that repeals that section of law. And it also repeals the new crime use of prohibited restraint as it was drafted in S-219 because it's reset forth in this bill. And then lastly is the effective date and it provides that the bill shall take effect on passage. Thank you, thank you, Bryn. Uh, Tom, is your hand up? 
Yes, yeah, I put it back up. Okay. Yeah, and, okay. and that section three repeals, I I, I guess I'd, I'd like another, uh, um, um, I don't know if it can be brief or not, but just, just to go over it again, exactly what it does, I guess. Um, I don't quite understand, so. Sure, so the, um, the whole section, what the two things that it repeals? Yes. Okay, so it repeals subdivision three of the justifiable homicide statute. So um, since it's not right in front of the committee, I can read it to you what that subdivision three says. It says that if a person, it essentially provides that if a law enforcement officer kills or wounds another, when lawfully called out to suppress riot or rebellion or to prevent or suppress invasion or to assist in serving legal process, in suppressing opposition against him or her in the just and necessary discharge of his or her duty, they shall not be li held liable, criminally liable for that um, killing or wounding of the other person. And we're repealing that in this? We're repealing that section of law. So uh, would I be right to assume that potentially it's taking away some protections of police officers? Well, um, as Representative Lalonde mentioned earlier, that is because of how broad that language is, it doesn't provide any sort of parameters on, um, on a law enforcement officer for killing or wounding a person, because essentially that language is so broad um, that it, it, it reads as if it provides that a law enforcement officer could not be held liable for killing or wounding another person um, while they were undertaking their lawful duties. So it's likely to be, it would likely be unconstitutional, that particular provision. Um, so uh, um, not, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, it would likely be unconstitutional. Has it ever been challenged in Vermont or uh, another state? I, I gotta believe it's probably been on the books here for a long time and, and potentially in other states. It has been on the books for a long time. In fact, um, I I think it was early 1900s that it was that it was yeah. enacted. So, so I see it as, as that this is some protection for police officers in, in certain situations. Is there anything else in the bill that would uh, cover some of this as far as their uh, as far as what we're kind of taking away? Well, yes, I think that the standards that you've set forth provide um, for sort of guardrails about about police officers when um, they are justified in using in using yeah. force against a person when they're justified in killing or wounding another person okay great just thank you us. yeah yeah that, that's great uh, and and I guess the uh, the second part section six um, if you could just go over that again sure so, and that the other repeal and this is again this is tricky this is just sort of a weird drafting thing when you're amending a section of law that hasn't yet taken effect, what this bill does is it amends that new crime, which doesn't take effect until next July. So because you're amending that, the way we have to do it is repeal it in, repeal the version that was set out in 219 and set out a new, a new version. And you're only changing it very slightly. I mean, the wording is very slight. It's a, it's a, I'm not, commenting on on the seriousness of the change it's just a small wording change that does have a so, so it's, it's just a technical change yes okay so, i mean the, i would not describe that change that you're making to the new crime as technical i think it is a it's a policy change but okay um, it's sort of technical why we're repealing it yes all right thank you okay martin quickly and then um yeah, just I want to flag uh, for Bryn before I forget this, because I, I hadn't thought of this for the repeal. I thought there was a similar provision related to uh, sheriff's use of uh, lethal force. If we could look at that and, and uh, if you can provide what that citation is, we may be wanting to repeal that as well. If I recall, there were there was another light, a similar provision. Yes. I, sure thing. Do you, I can I can find it now if you'd like, or I can email it to the committee. I email it to the committee, I, and we can look at it. And I would think that we'd want to do the same thing with that, but we should double check. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Brennan. Again, this is just 
just the beginning. Um, folks, if you have questions that you haven't asked, just uh, write them down and we'll get back to it. I do wanna let the committee know that I reached out to I believe at least um, 20 potential witnesses um, within the BIPOC and um, psychological psychiatric survivor community, um, asking them if they um, would like to testify. Uh, we're starting testimony uh, tomorrow, next week, um, and uh, heard from people's automatic emails who are away, but, um, but anyway, hopefully we'll be hearing from more people. We will be hearing from um, Bor Yang, Wilda White, and hopefully Representative Donahue uh, tomorrow. Um, and they were very much instrumental in, um, in, in this amendment and, uh, and working with, with Martin and, and others. And, um, Social Equity Caucus and others. So we will uh, we'll continue this work. Okay, so thank you. So now, hi Eric, we're gonna shift gears <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, do this and then folks will try to take a break, you know, around noontime or so, but um, okay. So welcome Eric, we're shifting now to uh, S234, which is the miscellaneous judiciary bill, uh, which we have not, finalized. Uh, last time uh, Eric was with us on this bill, we were looking at, it was first called the Amnesty, the DLS or Driver Amnesty Program as passed the Senate. And I think we're now calling it DLS reinstatement language. And uh, Eric, if you could um, bring us up to date, I know you made some changes. We also have Dave Evans here from uh, DMV uh, that can, can join us. Uh, so Eric, welcome, good morning. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Counsel. Good to see everybody this morning. Here to talk about uh, S-234. As the chair said, it's the miscellaneous judiciary bill. It has a lot of miscellaneous variety of provisions, you might even say, if <laughs> it's appropriately named. The, uh, the piece that we're talking about first, though, uh, is the as you were mentioning, uh, Representative Grad was initially, when it came over from the Senate, um, called an amnesty program for persons with suspended licenses. And the, the uh, House Judiciary Committee, as you've been looking at it, have decided to uh, alter the focus a little bit so that it's now a, a reinstatement fee program. The primary difference there, uh, just to refresh your recollection a little bit, as it came over from the Senate, it provided for, if a person had had their license suspended for over a year for non-criminal reasons, so that's sort of your qualifying criteria. Your license has been suspended for more than a year. The reason is non-criminal. In other words, it's not a DUI or something like that, so not associated with a criminal offense. Uh, in that situation, the uh, person could get their license back uh, without having to pay either the uh, Department of Motor Vehicles reinstatement fee, which I think is in the neighborhood of $81, something like that. You wouldn't have to pay that fee or, uh, oh, sorry, and you wouldn't have to pay any associated court fines and court fees. So for example, you know, if it had been some sort of a, you know, failure to stop at a stop sign or a speeding offense, you know, in addition to whatever reinstatement fee you would have had to have paid, there's a, there's a fine associated with that. And there's also surcharges, everything um, that would ordinarily have to be paid to the court uh, with a ticket. So uh, essentially the, the Senate bill said, we're gonna waive all of that both the court fines and the reinstatement fee, and the person would be able to get their license back if a, a year had passed and it was a non-criminal offense in the first place. So what the House proposal you're looking at now in this language uh, basically preserves the reinstatement fee waiver from the Department of Motor Vehicles, but uh, you'd still have to pay your court fees. So essentially what that means is a person could get their license back without paying the DMV uh, reinstatement fee, but they would still be uh, on the hook for whatever court fine they might have had associated with their ticket and the surcharges, that sort of thing. So uh, it doesn't stop you from getting your license back. You know, you could still get it, but the court would still have available to them all the collection procedures that they ordinarily use, whether it be a tax offset or a collection agent or whatever they ordinarily use to try and get their fees back. Um, but it, while that was going on, at least the person would still be able to drive legally because they'd have their license back. That sort of makes sense. So that's the primary distinction between uh, the House 
proposal in the Senate bill is that the Senate one waived all the court fees as well, whereas the House one says, well, we're, it's not going to waive them. The person will still be on the hook for them, but you can still get your license back without having to pay your the reimbursement fee to DMV. So that's the big picture. All right, um, thank you. And I, I do see um, Tom's hand is up. And, and again, this is, it doesn't mean that at some point we may not look at the court fees and, and look at going further with DLS, but this is, uh, I think this is a, a good step at this, at this point. Uh, Tom. Yeah, I think it's a great step also. Um, I, it, just in my opinion, I think the Senate went a little too far, but that's just me. Um, but Eric, uh, and, and maybe somebody else, but how much uh, can a court fee uh, vary, I guess? I mean, is there, uh, uh, I, I got to believe if depending on how much time one spends in court, um, uh, the more time, the more a court fee is, I, I'm not sure, but um, I, I guess I would, I would like a, maybe a quick explanation on how court fees work and how they're assessed. Well, I don't think it's, it, it um, varies based on the amount of time in court. The statute sets, you know, what a fine is for any particular offense. You know, it'll say it shall be fine, you know, $500. And then the, then the or not less than $500, I should say, is, way, is the way the language usually reads. Um, and then the court uh, has some discretion in there because that's a maximum fine. And then I, uh, uh, there's a uh, court committee that sets the range for waiver waiver fines. So in other words, you can pay less of a fine if you just sort of agree to your ticket. I don't know if you, you notice that whenever, well, if you happen to have gotten a ticket. <laughs> the, yeah, uh, I guess I, for, for some reason I was, I, I had pushed fines right out of my mind <laughs> and was just looking at, you know, the word court fees, just thinking that uh, that there was a fee for going into court for some reason, but I, I understand what you're saying now. So thank you. Right, right. And and, you, and the surcharges are set by statute too. That's another thing, you know, there, you probably recall that the statute will say like, you know, there's a surcharge that goes to the uh, victim's compensation organization or crime victims, uh, uh, the Center for Crime Victim Services, they get a, a little bit of a, each surcharge as well. So those are all folded into what, what the final sort of amount is that a person owes. Right, so so if we went with the Senate version uh, and we eliminated the, uh, the, the court fees, that would uh, take a lot of money away from some other programs through those surcharges, right? Uh, I don't know about a lot. I, I'm, I'm not familiar. Well, I don't some. Know how, but so, certainly some, yes, yeah. There'd right. be an effect. Yeah, okay. So uh, that's the big picture. So let's let's look for a moment at. Uh, I think everybody has just. I sent two documents that I know Lori was able to post. The one that just is uh, the short one relating to miscellaneous judiciary procedures. That's that. Uh, sorry, just related to the the reinstatement fee waiver program. So uh, sorry, Eric, I, excuse me. Sorry, I see Coach's hand is up. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Coach. Uh, just a, a quick technical question sure you muted your you're muted coach uh, is it the kind of thing that we can get a fiscal note on just on on this our amendment to the senate as passed right uh because the, the question that tom brought up about the the amount you know, someone should know roughly the effect, cause and effect of what it would be based on that change. Right, and I think, well, Dave Evans is here with us and um, I, I know he spoke to, um, to that before. So why don't we ask him about, okay. about the cost and, and DMV's um, ability to, to absorb this or not. Um, okay, you know, thank you. The, um, I see Dave Evans coming out. Do you, um, would would you like to to chime in now? I see you. I see you um, coming on to uh, to the group. I don't know if you wanted to. Good morning, Dave Evans with DMV. Sure. Um, the um, the court fees I have no knowledge of. We don't deal with those at all at uh, at DMV. Um, we when a person calls to reinstate their license, we advise them that they're 
our court fees because the court notifies us of that. Uh, and they work uh, out a payment arrangement or pay the court fees directly to the court and they send us a compliance. So I'm not sure how much um, exactly the fees are. However, in terms of this bill and any fiscal concerns, my understanding is that DMV does support this language and, um, and it's not asking for an additional appropriation or Right, we do support it and we're not asking for additional appropriation. Great. Thank you. Okay, that's um, Selena and then we'll go back to Eric. Yeah, and I, I don't know, this is maybe more committee discussion and I'm not uh, sure if you're, uh, if you wanna, if you wanna wait for that Maxine, but, or if it, um, I just, I, you know, I will, I will support this compromise if that's what it takes to move this across the finish line and get more people's licenses reinstated. But I actually, I just feel like I have to state on the record that I don't actually have a problem with the Senate version at all and have some concerns about any time we start to get into a discussion about um, like needing to enact punishments to fund our justice system. Um, I, I just think we, we, I hope we can shift our thinking on, on that. I mean, it, it is a functional practical issue that like there would be revenue loss that the court would then have to deal with. But um, yeah, I, I, I think pun it, yeah. So anyway, I just absolutely. felt like I had to say that yeah. stuff on the record and yeah, have a discussion from there. Right, right, no, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, okay, Eric. Yeah, so um, uh, we were speaking about sort of the big picture of what the uh, committee's proposal does. And if you look at the language, uh, I think it helps lay the foundation for that. And you'll see that essentially, and I'll get to where the new language is because that's at the conveniently located at the very bottom of the page. <laughs> so before that, uh, the, uh, you'll see that the, the proposal establishes the reinstatement fee waiver program the criteria are in subsection B, which I just described, and there's a date you see. So by December 15th, 2020 is when the, uh, these licenses are supposed to be reinstated. But by that time, it uh, says that DMV has got three, three uh, action items there. Number one, waive all license reinstatement fees for, and then you then the next language describes, well, who, who gets their reinstatement fees waived? And that's, you have two categories there, A and B. A, as I, we were just talking about this one, you've been suspended for non-criminal reasons for a year uh, and you've satisfied all other reinstatement conditions and requirements. So if there's any other condition or requirement that maybe the person, I think you recall Willa talking about this, maybe they have some counseling that has to be done or, or uh, uh, you know, drug and alcohol counseling, for example, any other conditions that might be associated, those all have to be satisfied as well. But once that's done uh, and the, um, suspension has lasted for a year or longer, well, then you qualify to get your license back without paying the reinstatement fee. That's group A. Group B uh, is a group of folks who, uh, if you had your license suspended prior to July 1st, 2014, now that has to do with, uh, you may recall Willa mentioning this as well, that there was a period of time, it's not the case anymore, but prior to July 1st, 2014, if you had your license suspended for failing to pay a judgment that you owe to the Judicial Bureau, which essentially is what we're just talking about, your traffic ticket plus whatever associated surcharges and fees might have been on that. If you had your license suspended solely for that reason, in other words, not for the underlying offense, not for going to you know, speeding or going through the stop sign or whatever it was, your only reason your license is suspended is because you didn't pay the fee, um, then the suspension was indefinite. It lasted until, until you paid. So we're grouping those folks in as who can also get their license back without paying the reinstatement fee. So if they satisfied any other conditions that they might've had to satisfy, um, they can also get their license back uh, um, now, essentially, since they, they would have been under suspension for more than a year since this date dates back to pre-2014. Uh, they can get theirs back without paying the, the reimbursement fee also. So those are the two universes of people who are, who are grouped in. So if you fall within within either of those groups, uh, what does DMV do? Uh, they waive the reinstatement fee. Number two, they reinstate the license. So if they've waived your fee, they have to reinstate your license. 
And number three, you see, is a notice provision. They also have to provide notice to these folks uh, that their, their fees have been waived uh, and that your license has been reinstated or uh, that they're ineligible reinst for reinstatement and the reason for that. So in other words, you let people know, well, you still have these other conditions that you have to do. You don't have to pay your, your reimbursement fee, but you've got another condition or two you have to satisfy. Um, and if you do that, you can get your license back. So that's the big picture of how it works. Um, but importantly, you'll see that uh, um, moving on to the definition section at the very bottom uh, of the bill or top of the next page, um, you'll see it's reinstatement conditions and requirements. And this is this goes to the point I made earlier about the, the distinction between the House bill and the Senate bill. You see that we defined it uh, not to include the amount due in a Judicial Bureau judgment. So in other words, when the, when the language says you have to satisfy all your reinstatement conditions and requirements, one of them is not going to be the amount you owe on your fine or your fee because you've defined it to not include that. So that way uh, you can get your license back simply by paying the reimbursement fee. Um, but the, one of the conditions you have to satisfy is not going to be paying your, your fine or your traffic ticket or your surcharges or anything else. So since that's defined out, you don't have to pay that. You can get your license back just by paying the $81 or whatever it is. Does that make sense to sort of drafting wise how that works? So the next piece, uh, and I'll let uh, Representative Lalonde talk a little bit about this as well, because this is something that, that's been, sorry. Maxine, if, if I may, um, be, yeah. before, yeah. Yeah, before yeah. we go, yeah. <clears throat> excuse me. Eric, I'm just wondering, so somebody goes through this whole process, they get their license back, and so if they have uh, another violation at some point, is there any way that, uh, that these violations can be stacked on top of each other, I guess you could say, to make their, their penalty even worse, e even though they, you know, to me, if, if you go with a year without your license, um, you've probably, you, you've paid the price, I guess. You, you've, to me, you've satisfied your, your, uh, uh, your duties or whatever, but is there any way that another, another violation, could it be stacked on top of the old violations and, and somebody is going to be uh, fined or, or whatever, uh, even, um, uh, I guess you could say even worse. Uh, I'm not sure the answer to that. It's an interesting question. Might be, in a sense, maybe it happens already in that, you know, points accumulate. So in other words, yeah. you know, you, you get three points for, you know, speeding or, and then you get seven points for, you know, something else. Those accumulate over time. Right. And, and uh, I think it's within a two year period. If you get 10 points within a two year period that you get a suspension. So that, um, you know, if you had some points on your license from a prior offense, and then like you say, a year later, you get another one, um, that can result in a, in a greater consequence in the sense that, uh, you know, you get a suspension that you otherwise wouldn't have gotten just for the one offense. Okay, yeah, so, so potentially, I guess, you know, because of the point system, but uh, that's kind of a short period of time, two years, but I would just hate to see somebody, uh, uh, um, get punished again for uh, something that they've already, uh, for a penalty they've already satisfied, that's all. Right, right. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Uh, similar, sort of a nice segue from what you were just saying, Representative Bernard, is, is the last, <laughs> the last uh, highlighted language you see there, subdivision three. This has to do, uh, the issue that's being addressed here is, um, and if you remember, it came up during the discussion the last time the committee talked about this, uh, and Representative Lalonde was, was bringing up this point that uh, by defining the offenses that a person can qualify for their waiver as non-criminal, that would have uh, included, for example, this, the situation I just described to Representative Burdett, that if, if someone, say, had got five points uh, six months ago, and you don't get a suspension for five points, but you get a suspension for 10 if you get 10 within two years, and then you get another five points, um, then you get suspended. Uh, that's a non-criminal reason, right? Because it's two civil offenses. So you've gotten your license suspended for a non-criminal reason, um, and uh, you would qualify for being able to get uh, your license reinstated and not pay the waiver fee uh, just by those things sort of being added on top of each other. 
and then you'd say you were still under suspension on December 15th when this goes into effect. If you were, uh, by virtue of the accumulation of points, you were still under suspension, you could qualify under the language as written to get your license back. And I think uh, the concern was that person who, who um, was under suspension at that time, um, even though their first offense was more than a year ago, right? Uh, shouldn't be able to necessarily get their license back yet. So the language that you see in subdivision three addresses that situation and says, all right, well, we're gonna do it definitionally again. We're gonna say suspended for non-criminal reasons does not include a license that is under suspension on December 15th, 2020 for the accumulation of 10 or more points. So if that person is under suspension when this program is supposed to get started by DMV because they've gotten 10 points within the last two year period, well, they don't qualify. So they're not, they're not able, they're, they're, and it makes sense if you think about it because they're still under suspension. The idea of, um, I think the proposal is that uh, um, you have, you aren't still sort of an offense that's happened within the last little short period of time. It's supposed to have been a year that has passed. Well, this person could only have been say three months since they got that last offense that, uh, that sort of bumped them into the suspension category. So that's, I think, part of the logic behind making sure that that group of people um, doesn't qualify for the reimbursement program. And Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so we'll see if folks have, have questions about it. But, but again, tell me uh, where this came from. Was, was this, I don't know, Martin, if you wanted to. Yeah. Well, I, did, I mean, I, the main thing is that um, the accumulation of points and then the suspension because of points, uh, that acts as a deterrent. I mean, and, we, and, and looking back at, um, back in the days of looking at uh, distracted driving, what was the best deterrence? I know I, I understood that really points are where you get some deterrent uh, value. And if somebody is, has a suspension because of, of points, that means that they've probably earned that consequence. And, and I don't want to forgive that consequence uh, inadvertently. But now, what I understand though, and, and, and uh, Dave Evans can certainly uh, comment on this, I, I did have a chance to chat with him, uh, is this is a very rare occurrence because for most of, the, most of the 10 point plus suspensions are not for a year, but it, it is something that could happen. But, but my understanding is fairly rare occurrence and I did talk to Dave about whether uh, it would be sufficient that uh, the language that uh, otherwise you know, satisfied the reinstatement conditions and requirements, whether that would cover the situation. And, and again, Dave can testify to this and uh, told me that, yes, that's the case, but I'm thinking, and I'd like to hear uh, Dave's uh, input on this because this is language we didn't, I didn't have when I was talking to him, about whether it clarifies the situation, that new language that Eric proposed, which I kind of think it does, but but if it's, but let's hear from Dave. I, again, it's fairly rare circumstances though, is my understanding, but it is one that I think that the consequence of, uh, of the accumulation of points shouldn't be forgiven. Okay, anybody have questions on that new language for Eric before we, Turn to Dave to DMB. Oh, okay, right, hey, Eric. Anything else? No, Martin? not for right now. I think that's that pretty much sums up uh, this piece of it. Okay, great. All right, thank you. So let's sure. turn to uh, to Dave Evans, please. Great, thank you. And I wonder if if. Uh, if you could let us know um, your uh, your thoughts on um, on this new language specifically in um, in three. Well, I think that would that definitely would work. Um, the uh, the point violations is as Representative Long said, it's very rare that someone accumulates ten points in a short period of time. I mean, there are those cases where you know um, somebody will go out and get uh, two or three speeding tickets in a two week period. I, that's possible. Uh, but for the most part, uh, it's a fluid situation when you're dealing with points. Some will get a ticket and they'll have three points added and then they'll go 
you know, several months or a year and maybe get a, a, a stop sign violation, have two points added, and they'll go a little further. And while they're accumulating points, points are also dropping off. Um, so it's, um, it's not that common uh, to have somebody, um, you know, be in that situation. What, what's, you know, the, what's more of a concern to us are those folks that don't learn and continue to continue to that behavior that causes those points to be added. Um, you know, if, if you're looking at a very short period of time, so for example, if somebody accumulates 10 points in a two year period, they get a 30 day suspension. And then that length of suspension increases with each additional five points that are added to the record. Um, so they, they would get a second suspension when they hit 15 points, a third suspension when they hit 20 points. But you have to remember that during this period of time, some of those points typically are dropping off. So those, you know, 20 day, you know, 20 point suspensions are extremely rare. Um, you know, we, we have a few um, every, uh, every three months or four months, um, a quarter, each quarter will have a few that hit that 15 point limit. Um, but uh, the most common is the 10 point um, 30 day suspension. There's only one um, offense that is a 10 point offense that I'm aware of, and that's negligent operation, which is a criminal charge. Um, and uh, so we're just dealing with, with point suspensions. 99.9% .9 of the time, we're dealing with, uh, with VCVCs or civil, uh, civil complaints um, that accumulate the points. Thank you. And so in terms of this language, because we are just seeing it now, is this is this language that that DMV um, needs? Is it is it addressing a, an existing problem? Uh, I know it wasn't part of the what the Senate passed and we hadn't seen yeah. it yet. I think that this uh, this definitely defines um, the point situation. Um, you know, I, I think without that, one could argue that um, that point suspensions should be included in this uh, this amnesty, um, and that's certainly I don't think where we want to go with this. Okay, so it's, so it's clarifying. Okay, thank you. Uh, anything else on on this language that you'd that you'd like to add? No, I, I think the department supports. Uh, in my opinion, the department supports uh, the way it's written. Um, we absolutely, uh, you know, support getting people back to work and getting them legal, legally driving on the road. Um, Great, I thank you. We'll go a long way towards that initiative. Great, thank you. Appreciate it. Martin, your hand was up and now it's down. It's... Well, I, I guess I, I just want to make sure because um, we took this language up and May, June, uh, June, I guess is time for, I think, if I'm remembering right. And at that time, uh, we put in the December 15th uh, due date for this. But since then, we've gone on recess, we've come back, uh, the state of emergency is continuing. I want to make sure that that's still a realistic uh, deadline for this to occur. And I guess I ask uh, if I could ask Dave uh, if um, if that is still a reasonable deadline because a lot of things have happened in the last two three months since we put that. They have, and, and, and thank you for addressing that. Um, I don't think December fifteenth is a reasonable deadline, and, and the reason why is because we're in the process of reopening DMV, so all of our energy is going toward that. In addition, um, this would be a huge, huge uh, undertaking. Um, you know, you're involving a lot of man hours um, researching these and getting the paperwork done and getting the reinstatements done. Uh, for us to get that done in this short period of time between now, even though it sounds like it's a fairly long period, but it's a very short period if you look at it. Um, I would, uh, would propose that um, perhaps look at it beginning January 1st and ending April 30th. And that would give us ample opportunity to be able to get DMV reopened and, uh, and move forward on that and uh, also be able to, uh, to take on this, uh, this task of, of reinstating people. So, so if that was the date, I assume that once this passed, you would be able to start that process. It's just a matter of that April date is the end date for having gotten through the 20 some thousand people 
I mean, it's not like that's not the date that you start. That's the date that all that work should be done, which means presumably between the time it's passed and that date, there will be work at DMV to get that done. Absolutely. We would plan on starting January, January 1. And, uh, and the final date would be uh, April 30. Yeah, and I don't think there would be a, um, a start date as much. I don't think we have, there's, there was a start date uh, on the Senate bill, uh, but we don't have really a start date. We just have an end date here. Uh, so if you all move on it more quickly, that's great. Uh, but the, the key is would be the an April date, if that's the one that everybody is fine with. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I think that I think that makes sense. Anybody else? And I think I need to go let my dog out. Oh, Coach, there you are. I would support that uh, that time change um, as well uh, with everything that's occurred. And, you know, I'm really happy for you guys uh, being able to open, Dave. Um, and <laughs> I know it's going to be yeehaw. Um, but, um, you know, I, I know a lot of your, your folks and I've been in contact with several on some other projects. And um, um, it looks like it's going to roll out really well. So congratulations on that. Thank you. So far, it has moved out beyond uh, our, our expectation. Uh, everything's going smoothly. Um, and it's, it's, it's absolutely wonderful to see people back in 120. Uh, over the winter, there were many days I was the only person in 120 working because I, I continued to work at my office due to the whole COVID thing. And, uh, very strange to be in a building all by yourself and to look up and down State Street and not see a person or a car on State Street. Uh, yeah. So it, it's really nice to have people back. For sure. Well, kudos and thanks a lot for your work. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And thank you, Coach, for that. Okay. Great. All right. I'm not seeing any other hands. Okay. Um, so I'm thinking, do folks want to? So, um, so, in terms of next steps, I was going to ask Eric to go through at a high level S234 to remind us what's still in there. Uh, some things have been taken out. Uh, and then we're going to um, uh, hear from Michelle. Do people want to um, take a break now or want to hear from Eric? Um, it's hard to gauge what people's energy and needs are. So just, just speak up and tell me what's, what's best for folks. Committee. I'll speak up. Let's take 10 minutes. Okay. <laughs> we will do that. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Can I ask you a quick question as well, uh, Maxine? Yep. Since on, on this um, the DLS thing, yeah. Uh, yeah. Sh how should we uh, pass this by transportation? I, I thought that this, at least they should be given a heads up or should we see if Eric and, and I'm happy to be part of it as well, should go and present it to him or what, what were you thinking on this? Um, I was going to work with um, Anthea and have her run it, okay. have her run it by okay. by Kurt, um, which yeah. And okay, so I'm all set. I don't have to do anything else on that. All right. Yeah. Now, no, but um, and we also want to make sure that Senator Sears um, gets gets this newest one because um, I know we had the um, data copy of the last one. So all right. So let's come back around around noonish. Okay, ten minutes or so. Thank you. So Michelle, we're running a little late, just to give you a heads up. So you're still working on DUI or are you ready um, to switch? Um, no, we're not ready to switch yet. We're working on the, okay. um, Eric is just gonna do sort of a high level overview of miscellaneous judiciary and go through some sections and then, and then we'll switch to you. Okay, no problem. Right. Yeah, thanks. Okay, great. 
So on our uh, committee page, we have um, S234. It's been a long time since we've, we've looked at this. Uh, so I've asked Eric to do just, just a very quick high level, you know, Eric, something like sections one from one to six came from the AG's office and changes the name, you know, that, that type of thing. I don't think we need to do a walkthrough or just, you know, more of a summary um, of the uh, sections, especially ones that we haven't changed. There are some sections that aren't in here because of our sunset bill. And then there's some sections that are, that are taken out. So, um, so Eric, is that, is that clear in terms of? Yeah, I think so. Sounds good. Okay, great. And then I'll so hi again, uh, everybody. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just say I'll, I'll chime in with, you know, when things have been taken out or some changes or whatever. So okay, yeah, sounds good. Uh, Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Counsel again to do a quick uh, description of the different pieces that are in the miscellaneous bill S two thirty four as the committee is proposing that uh, to the Senate. You'll see the this version, the, the document that you're looking at shows House changes to Senate bill highlighted in yellow. So any proposed changes to the bill that passed the Senate, you can see identified in yellow. So again, it's a you know 35 page bill with many different sections and pieces. It could easily do an hour walkthrough on it. So I'll try and speed through as quickly as possible. Um, and so I'll be, any, anybody has any questions as I go along, feel free to jump in. So the first five sections of the bill were requested by the Attorney General's Office and the Court Diversion Program, basically involving changing the name of the, um, the Youth Substance Abuse Safety Program to the Youth Substance Awareness Safety Program. I think the reason for that is the use of some people who participate in the program didn't feel they had substance abuse problems and that the, the diversion program and the court felt that was actually discouraging people from participating in the program, just the name of it. So they're changing it from uh, Substance Abuse Safety Program to Substance Awareness Safety Program. That's one through five. If you get to sections five and six, there, and seven actually, are all also uh, connected. They clarify that uh, right now, if you're a person's under 21 years old, they could be charged with possession of alcohol or possession of marijuana um, as either a civil offense or a juvenile offense. And I think and the, this is sort of an ambiguity in the statute. And everyone agrees that the intent of the legislature was to have uh, persons uh, between ages 16 and 21 charged with a civil offense. But if you were under 16, you'd be charged with a juvenile offense. So this language just clarifies that that's what happens. You can see the way it works. If, for example, in section five, person 16 years of age or older is the civil offense. If you're under 16, you get charged with the same thing, possession of alcohol or marijuana, it would be a juvenile, would go to the family division, a juvenile offense. Um, another, because it's gonna come up in a minute, the thing to note about these statutes, you can see it in the title of section five, it's not just possessing alcohol or marijuana or whatever that, that um, is a violation, it's also use of a fake ID. So that's just it all encompassed within the same statute. It's possession, procuring, or misrepresenting your age for alcohol. I only point that out because it's about to become relevant to another section of the bill. So bearing that in mind, um, we go to section eight. So section eight uh, is a change to a provision in Title 23, the motor vehicle statutes, because there's a separate statute in section eight that has to do with using a counterfeit license, right? Now, if you think about it, a person who then used an underage person who used a fake ID to buy alcohol could be charged under either one of those statutes, right? Because you're violating both. You're using a fake license for something and you're also misrepresenting your age to get alcohol. The problem that's come up with that is that um, if you get charged under this Title 23 statute, which you see in Section 8, uh, it doesn't have the opportunity to go to the diversion program, which is the whole intent of having those separate uh, civil violation statutes for possessing and using a fake ID, et cetera. So what this does is it adds some clarifying language in, uh, to this section in Title 23 that says, hey, if a person can be charged with violating either one of those, in other words, if you'd qualify because of your age to be charged with a, being a minor using a fake ID, um, then you gotta get charged with that offense rather than uh, the violation of Title 23. That way, 
you'll be able to go to the court diversion program, which I think is the legislative intent for people who are under 21 years old using fake IDs. You don't want them being charged with these uh, motor vehicle offenses where you can't go to court diversion. So that's what's going on in um, uh, section eight. Section nine has to do, with, this is a request from the court. And evidently because of the way the statute is drafted and written, people who plead uh, no contest when they get a traffic ticket or another kind of judicial bureau offense, they're doing that and they're not realizing that a no, that a no contest plea, uh, they're thinking that they'll be able to challenge it later on. They'll be able to come into court and assert that they, they didn't commit the offense or they were not guilty for some reason. Not grasping that no contest means you don't admit or, or deny, but you can't challenge it later on. You're agreeing that it's over. So the idea proposed by the court and tweaked a little bit by me is just to put language in there that makes clear that that's not the case. That all you're doing, you see the language is different now. You're not, you get rid of the whole no contest language from the ticket. You just, you just have to state whether they, um, whether they request a hearing or they accept the penalties without a hearing. Simple as that. That way there's not gonna be any confusion about what the words no contest mean. They'll either you know, accept it, pay the ticket or not accept it and say, I want a court hearing. Keeping it sort of simple and, and more um, layperson's terms, I would say. Uh, so that was section nine. Uh, section 10 is just, it was Judge Tomasi who noticed that, that there's an incorrect cross-reference in an existing statute, so that's corrected. Um, section 11 is similar. That was noticed by the VBA, actually. The Bar Association noticed that in the uh, oath statute, which is the oath that attorneys take uh, when they get admitted to the bar, um, there, there was a reference to specifically a, a non-gender inclusive reference. It says, you have to say that you will delay no man for lucre or malice, obviously an old statute. <laughs> and so that's changed that to person. So updating it uh, for political, uh, sorry, for gender inclusive language. Um, so moving on to section 12, also purely technical, just a cross-reference that was incorrect is corrected there. Now you then see section 13, a lot of struck language. So this is a proposal. This was the proposal from the Senate that would require um, or allow the victim to request that anyone who, uh, on a criminal offender who had uh, committed any sex offense be tested uh, for uh, HIV, uh, the presence of HIV in their blood. And so essentially there's a, a element of that that exists in current law. And what exists in current law is that, that uh, ability to have the offender tested is permitted, but it's only after conviction. Right, that's the key distinction. So what the Senate had proposed and that this is originally proposed actually from the Department of State's attorneys and sheriffs um, in connection with uh, some grant money. But their proposal was that the, for HIV uh, testing, it would happen, the, the, the victim could get the testing before conviction. It would be at the finding of a probable cause finding at arraignment. So uh, that's obviously a much earlier stage of the proceedings and I think uh, for that reason, that the the this committee decided that um, they wanted to, didn't want to go forward with that proposal. So actually, let me let me clarify. It. Um, it's really I decided. <laughs> um, we did take testimony, and after hearing the um, the testimony, and then speaking to uh, states' attorneys, victims' advocates, a number of folks during our uh, during our research uh, recess. Um, you know this this language is about getting about getting a federal grant um and there have been cases where the policy is is not necessarily good policy where uh where we have um declined uh to put in the language because of the policy and therefore have to pay it's a five percent penalty in this case um three-year grant it's um $37,000 over three years if we don't have this language in. Um, I've spoken to the, the Appropriations Committee is, is aware of this, uh, but I, do, I, I don't think this, this language, if it was included, would be good policy. It does not help victims. Um, and uh, so anyway, so we've to, decided to take that out. Um, I've spoken with Senator Sears. And again, appropriations um, is well aware of, of the, uh, the penalty that needs to be paid. My understanding is that the penalty can be paid from uh, the federal grant money. 
So anybody, um, Martin, I think you had your question, you have your hand up about language that didn't get into the last section, right? Um, uh, section 11? Yeah, but- Yeah, um, I did. But any, uh, any questions about, about this section coming out? That's my proposal, so. Okay, great. So yeah, Martin, I think you had an amendment that's not in here in terms of the, uh, right? Yeah, uh, since we're modernizing the oath, uh, my suggestion was the, to change the affirmation. I um, mean, it could still say, so help you God. I think that, that we have, I know definitely we have in, uh, with respect to the language that we use when we're sworn in uh, as legislators, uh, that we have options you, know, you can either do this, so help me God, or there's this other option. Uh, I, I can't remember the language off the top of my head, but I probably raised that last time. But if, I, I mean, if we're gonna modernize it, we may as well modernize that component of it as well. Right. And Representative Brachelson gave the thumbs up on that as well. So at least I have two people who think that that's a good idea. Yeah, no, we, we yeah, we did discuss it. Uh, okay, great, yeah. Getting thumbs up yeah, I can look into that. I think probably something along the lines of if this is what you're thinking, I know I've I've heard the similar oaths, and I can't remember if it's the legislative one or not, but I certainly have heard other ones where someone swears under the pains and penalties of perjury or something like that. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. It is that is that is that's the language. Yeah. Okay. That is the one used for legislative too. Oh great. But I think I think that both those options are there, right? I mean, it's it, we're not getting a, a rid of God here. We're given another uh, option as well, is my understanding. Right. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Great. Uh, so so moving on right along sections uh, fourteen and fifteen under under current law, you can't get your you know you've dealt with expungement and sealing in here quite a bit and. Uh, person's records can't be expunged or sealed until they've paid restitution. That's current law. That just, this just makes clear that any accompanying court surcharges also have to be paid in addition to the restitution uh, before someone can get their records uh, expunged or sealed. Um, section 16 is at the request of the Probate Judges Association. And this is uh, essentially right now you can get your will allowed. And by the term allowed means that Essentially, the court saying, "Okay, this is the this is the uh, official and legally recognized will that we're going to use to distribute the property." You know, it has to be allowed uh, in order for it to sort of reach that formal status, and it essentially means that no longer can anyone contest the will. You, know, you can't say that, "Well, the person wasn't under sound mind or body, or there was fraud, there was duress, there was something like that." Once the will is allowed, that's the formal will that's going to be used. Right now. Um, in order to get the will allowed, you have to have two of the witnesses uh, affirm, sign before a notary public a sworn statement that uh, that the will was executed under the requirements of the statute. You know, there was no duress, there was no fraud, they were of sound of mind, mind and body, etc. This uh, just adds one other option. You could still do that. You could still have your two witnesses sign in front of a notary public, or that provides another option. You see that you could have one of the witnesses actually come into court physically and testify in person uh, to the same thing, that it was executed you know, properly according to the statute. So it just basically gives another option um, that you can have one witness testify in court instead of having both witnesses do it in front of a notary. Uh, section 17, also technical, just removes an incorrectly placed conjunction or. Uh, section 18 has to do with monetary, monetary settlements that are entered into on behalf of a minor. So this is a situation where like you imagine a minor is injured in a car accident when he or she is 15 years old, the insurance company offers a settlement. Uh, well, a minor is not of legal age. They can't, they can't agree to that settlement legally. Uh, it has to, there has to be an adult, uh, typically a parent or, or a guardian who executes that uh, acceptance, uh, that settlement rather on behalf of the minor. Right now in statute, um, those settlements on behalf of a minor have to be approved by the court if they're above a certain monetary threshold. And the monetary threshold right now is $1,500. Um, that hasn't been changed since the 1970s. So this just changes that threshold from 1,500 to 10,000, sort of a, 
updating with the, you could almost call it a, uh, an, what a, uh, an inflation adjustment, right? <laughs> it was $1,500 threshold was used in the mid 70s. Uh, the proposal is that, you know, having court approval of a $2,500 settlement, for example, isn't really necessary. So they bumped the threshold up to 10,000. Anything above 10,000 would still require the court to get involved and approve the settlement that an adult is making on behalf of a minor to make sure that you know, the minor's best interests are, are really being served. Uh, section 19, also technical, just removes a missing conjunction. Um, section 20, there's a reference to parent-child contact in section 20, um, but that's the child support statute. So that's uh, really irrelevant. Uh, the, that's not something that the court considers in the, in the context of child support proceedings. So that was requested by the family division to, to strike that language because it's not something that's relevant uh, to that statute. Um, section 21 was uh, requested by Judge Grierson. And that has to do, you see, it's a, as you remember from many discussions in this committee, mental health proceedings uh, can take place both in the criminal division and in the family division, depending on whether it's coming out of a criminal matter or coming out of a civil matter, um, involuntary commitment, for example. Uh, but the, the statute incorrectly refers just to the criminal division. So uh, that's not accurate because, as I said, those proceedings could take place in criminal or family court. And so the reference is corrected so that it just says the superior court. Um, 22, also a technical fix. The, the statute as written permits the probate division to charge a fee in cases that actually aren't in the probate division. <laughs> They're actually in the civil division. So that struck. Uh, section 23, technical, removes a reference to guardian ad litem because it actually already appears in the same statute elsewhere. So if you look up, for example, it's struck in subdivision E, but if you look in subdivision D, three lines in, it's already there. So it just appears twice, it's redundant, no need to have it twice. Um, section 24 is uh, exactly the same. It's, a, it's the same as what I mentioned earlier. It's another, another statute where it's making clear that um, expungement and sealing can't happen until a person pays all their surcharges in addition to their, their uh, restitution. Uh, now we get to section 25, you see that section is struck. And this is, uh, you will recall the sunset repeal. We're getting to a couple of sunset repeals. This has to do with uh, changes that were made to the diversion program back in uh, 2017. And this is struck only because, remember, you passed it during the during the session back in, uh, I think it passed in April or May. It was fairly early on. You passed a sunsets bill. And the decision at that time was to, rather than repeal any sunsets, just to extend them for a year. So that, that provision has already passed uh, earlier in the session. And it will extend the sunset to July 1st of 2021. And then you guys could revisit it next year and decide if you want to uh, repeal the sunset permanently. Excuse me, Barbara, I see your hand up. So Eric, back in section 24, um, if we have what I'm going to call automatic expungement, will that section be a problem? Um, I don't know for sure because I'm not familiar with automatic expungement the way Bryn is, but, but my guess is that the answer is that it would not because existing law already provides that the, they can't be expunged or sealed until the restitution is paid. So it's a similar concept. Uh, it's just making sure that surcharges as well. But I don't know for sure. I don't want to say 100%. So I'd, I'd want to run that by Bryn. Okay, thanks. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so back to the uh, sunsets. Um, well, actually, before we get to the uh, sunset, you see there's another piece, section uh, 25, that does stay in. That repeal, that's the uh, voluntary arbitration of medical malpractice cases. And uh, uh, Judge Grierson testified that the chapter has never been used since the day it was enacted in 1975. So uh, since it's never been used, the, the, I think the thought is to, you know, save some trees, free up some space in the Vermont statutes annotated and, and repeal it. 
Uh, another another sunset, though, in Section 27. Remember, this is the Racial Disparities in Criminal and Juvenile Justice uh, System Advisory Panel. Same thing as the one we just looked at with diversion. This is struck from this bill, but it had already passed. You guys passed it uh, in the in your sunset bill and extended it again uh, by a year to July 1st, 2021. And then you can again revisit it uh, when you come back and see if you want to repeal it permanently. Section 28, you see this, uh, we already discussed earlier this morning, this is the amnesty program. So the proposal was to repeal the version that passed the Senate, the full amnesty from paying court fines and the DMV reimbursement fee and replace it with this reinstatement fee waiver program, which you see starts on the bottom of page 25. And that language is all, we looked at it already this morning. It's the exact same language that we looked at. Uh, it has the, um, you see on page 27, the, the new definitions that clarified that, that uh, the court fines and court penalties would not be waived. The, the person would still get their license back and the court would still be able to collect those, those penalties um, as they ordinarily do. Uh, moving on then to section 29, that gives the legislative council authority to replace the word marijuana with the word cannabis. Uh, that language also passed the Senate in, in S54, I believe. So uh, I'll, I'll connect with Michelle on this to make sure that we don't duplicate anything. But uh, for now it's in here because it's still unclear what's gonna happen to S54. Section 30, uh, and actually sections 30 through 32, um, have to do with what's known as special immigration juvenile status. Now, what that is, is a federally established concept. And what it, what it means is that, um, and it's, a, it's unique actually, it's unusual in federal law, and that it's, it's a federal status that requires a state court order in order for uh, someone to apply for this federal status. So if a child uh, cannot, uh, an, uh, an immigrant child cannot reunify uh, with his or her parents because of abuse, abandonment, or neglect, um, then that child can um, petition the United States Custom and Immigration Service for what's known as special immigration juvenile status. And that allows the child to obtain lawful permanent immigration status if they've been able to have this court order uh, that shows they can't reunify as a result of abuse, abandonment, or neglect. So what this these sections do is they establish a procedure under state law so that the child can obtain that order. The child can obtain, get an official order that qualifies under the federal standard um, to allow them to apply for special immigration juvenile status. Now it doesn't, we can't affect what Customs and Immigration is gonna decide on the, on the application, of course, that's a matter of federal law. But what this does is it just sets up um, in Vermont law, the structures uh, and the procedure that the child uh, can follow to uh, make that application to the federal government. And then uh, the federal government makes the, makes the ultimate decision about whether they qualify. But um, I think it, it provides a, uh, an, uh, the creation in state law of the type of order that the, that the child would need to bring to the federal agency and say, here's the order. I can't reunify with my parents because of abuse, abandonment, neglect, et cetera. So therefore I'd like to apply for this status and then they can move forward with their application. Does that make sense? Uh, so lastly, uh, then section 33 is uh, basically all just is changing. And this is also at the request of the court and of the diversion program to make the uh, risk assessments and uh, uh, request for pretrial services uh, discretionary rather than mandatory. So the way the statute is written now, you know, under certain circumstances, risk, risk assessments shall be done and uh, pretrial services shall be offered. And it basically shifts that to a, a mandatory uh, situation. And I think if I understood correctly from the AG and the court, they simply don't have the resources right now to do it in every situation. So it uh, makes it a permissive one. And actually, I just noticed uh, that uh, we probably want to change the effective date, <laughs> which now says July 1st, 2020. Um, so, uh, so actually, I'm not even sure what effective date we're using now. Um, so I'll double check in our office with that, whether it's on passage or whether we're using uh, on a, 
an October effective date, but I'll, I'll look into that and see what uh, what change needs to be made. Okay, great. And then uh, can I get you in a second there? So there will be a few more things that will be on here, and it might be that um, that Michelle has it. But this is where we're going to fix the um, the uh, internet crimes uh, that Michelle spoke about. That language that's needed. Um, will be here. And then I think Michelle has something else regarding um, clarifying cultivation in terms of a recent court decision. Uh, and, I uh, and then we'll talk about the cannabis expungement. Uh, okay, I do see, boy, let's see. I saw Ken and then Kelly. And um, right. folks, I realize that we're up against time, but I'm hoping that we could just um, go a little longer just to at least get through all of this. I, Oops, sorry, I apologize. I, I've got really crappy internet here. Who requested that last change, Eric? Wait, which one? I think the Attorney General's office and the court. Is that was that the last one that he said it was somebody requested a change or something? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Uh, Kelly. Uh, thanks. I just have a clarification on um, section 13 um, that the the funding that has changed that will change um, because of that is it is it going to affect a certain area? Well, I know you said you spoke to appropriations, but where will it be uh, certainly affecting people? So I'm not sure in terms of what if um, if the state's attorneys have to pay the um, penalty of that, how that might change positions or, or anything like that. The hope is that it, it wouldn't, because uh, certainly the funding um, is very, you know, it goes to domestic violence investigators and prosecutors, I believe, which is very important. And uh, appropriations understands that. So. I just had communication with a constituent lab before we took a break that they thought it was coming from, a, from a Wyndham County. We've, yeah, we've heard that too, and okay. uh, yeah, and appropriations understands that and understands the importance of the of those programs. Okay, thank you. Great. Okay, so um, if folks could stay a little bit longer, that'd be great just to get through all these sections, at least you know in terms of a walkthrough. Um, if if you can, that'd be great. Um, okay, all right, great. Well, Eric, thank you. And, sure. then, um, and then Michelle will turn to you. And I think Michelle, you have some language for us to look at. I do. I uh, emailed it um, a little earlier today. And also I believe Lori has posted it as well. So you should have two documents from me. One's gonna be a, uh, a just the kind of standalone language that uh, has four sections and addresses, as the chair had mentioned, it addresses a technical fix to existing expungement law. It um, also has the, uh, has the other pieces that we were discussing with regard to the cannabis piece. And then also I sent uh, Eric a separate piece of the language on the child sexual exploitation, which you guys have already talked about. So that's all said. And all this is, I think the idea is that it would go into the miscellaneous bill. Um, you should also have a copy of a little one uh, one page chart that I did that looks at the penalties, the existing penalties com um, compared to what they would be under this proposal. Um, so uh, let me walk you through if it's okay. I'll walk you through the amendment first, and then we'll and when we get to the penalty section, I'll we'll, we'll take a look at the chart as well. Does that work, everybody? Um, so if you look, you should be looking at um, a document from me uh, that has four sections on it. It's dated yesterday, has my initials up at the top. It's eight pages. So section A, and this is, I just labeled them that way because I'm not sure how uh, Eric wants to organize them in S-234, but so section A is the expungement section. And I flipped them you know, because before you had the, the amendments to section 4230, I just flipped because I think the having the expungement first kind of sets the tone for the rest since that seems to be the big, the big issue. 
Um, so I highlighted the language in yellow that's different. If you look at subsection B, you'll see it says that the court shall order the expungement of the criminal history records for those particular misdemeanor violations that occurred prior to January 1st of this upcoming year. Um, uh, and the process for expunging these records shall be completed by the court and all entities subject to the order, not later than January 1st, 2022. And so what, and so the way that that works is you wanna tag the, um, the uh, change to the decrim with the date on which you start doing the expungements. And so that would be take a year and we, I expanded the language so that it's just uh, clear that it's not just being completed by the court, but also any entity that is subject to the orders. I think we talked about it yesterday that um, after VCIC receives an expungement order, they've usually completed all their work with regard to that order within 30 days. Um, and so, and then the, the local agencies would also have to complete that work within a, within a year, uh, a year's time. Um, the next change is we look at subsection C. I just changed, it said there the respondent, I just, because we're not, um, doing petitions and it's an automatic, I just changed it to clarify that it's the notice, that the court has to provide notice of the expungement to the person who is the subject of the record. So that's just a little technical tweak. And then subsection D is really kind of the heart of the new stuff that after y'all talked about uh, for the last couple meetings on this. So you see that subsection D starting on line 11 on page two, is that on and after January 1st of 21, a person who was arrested or convicted of a violation of the misdemeanor uh, cannabis prior to such date, um, first shall not be required to acknowledge the existence of such a criminal rec history record or answer questions about the record in any application for employment, license, civil right or privilege or in, the, in an appearance as a witness in any proceeding or hearing. And so that was to try to address your concerns that, well, because expungement will take some time, um, uh, how can we, how could you uh, kind of get relief to folks who have those criminal history records um, more quickly rather than waiting for the whole completion of the cycle uh, to go through and have the orders issued? Because the court orders are really saying it's a directive to everybody that holds records to be destroying those records. But you can still say that these folks can say because what it is is that as of January 1st, those, those convictions, the, the offenses for which people had those convictions will no longer be crimes. So they could go through the other processes through existing law and petition, but you're providing this kind of expedited process for those folks. And so as of January 1st, those offenses will no longer be crimes. And so you're saying that they would, those folks who had a, have a conviction for it could say on an employment application, they don't have to disclose anything. So it was gonna take the court longer to do the official orders and everybody to get rid of those records, but people could, could uh, make that statement. Great, right. thank you, Michelle. I do see Martin's hand up. So this is a somewhat minor point, but just backing up to line six, seven, the, pers uh, the court shall notify you know, the person who was subject of the record, having something in there about the last known address to the court, because that was already raised as an issue that uh, if we're telling them you have to contact them and, and who knows how long ago that record was created and there may no be, not be any real reasonable way to contact them. So something along those lines. Uh, sure. I mean, I assume that that's what they would be doing anyway, but your concern is that they, if that isn't in there, that they, there might be some interpretation that they have to do some kind of investigation to right. track them down. Right, right. That's my concern. And, and that I don't think should be required. I, others may disagree and think that it's required, but I think that that's might be asking just a, a bit too much, particularly since in D, you know, those in uh, D3 or whatever it is, it says that you don't even have to be notified and you're, you're covered essentially. Okay, sure. Thank you, uh, Barbara. Thanks, so actually to Martin's point, maybe it should just be that there's some public 
announcements that this is happening rather than trying to track down um, everybody. Um, but I have one other question, which is, uh, Michelle, you didn't mention, you mentioned employment and then court proceedings. If somebody has like a housing application, um, I'm just thinking of where else would do they ask about convictions? So this is this language. What I did is I took what we already had in the bill around people don't have to disclose and that's modeled after existing law. So I didn't start to add categories or all that. So this is just mirroring existing law. So I think if you wanted to go down that road, I think you should maybe take it up in the context of do you want to address it holistically rather than have something that's different here than what you have in the underlying law. Thank you. Sure. Um, so I'm going to move on to subdivision D2. So again, on and after this January 1st, if someone had a conviction for those violations, um, they in subdivision two may deny the existence of the record regardless of whether the person has received notice from the court that an expungement order has been issued on the person's behalf. So again, that's just kind of coupled with subdivision one that says you don't have to wait for the court to actually issue that order to be able to assert that you have no you have no conviction there. And it could be, we don't yet know how the court will um, approach this. So it could be that maybe they go alphabetically, maybe they take it in chunks in terms of years. We're gonna take you know, anything from uh, you know, the, the January 1st, 2021, you know, and go back a decade and do that chunk first, and then we'll go back another decade or however, but somebody doesn't need to wait until their number is called in order to be able to assert that they don't have a record. And then the top of page three is that they um, is just clarifying that that person uh, may utilize the procedures that are already in law um, to seek expungement or sealing prior to, to the court taking steps to issue an expungement order. And that was, I think somebody had raised in committee, well, you know, what if somebody, what if it fit within the existing categories and they could petition now um, and they don't want to wait till their number comes up because they've got something important they need to do in terms of looking for a job or something like that. And they don't want to leave it up to whenever the timing is for that order. And they prefer to initiate it themselves and take care of it that way is that just because you have provided this expedited approach, it doesn't cut off, cut off their ability to, to use the existing, um, the existing process. Great, yes, that's good. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, to move on. Can I ask you another question? And I'm sorry if I zoned out on this the last several times we talked about this. Why, why do we need an order at all? I mean, I, yeah, I wanna have an order eventually, but why not when this bill is effective uh, that we are allowing these individuals to say they, they do not have a criminal history. I mean, are we prevented from doing that? That's what you do in D1. In, right, so I guess I don't understand D3 why that's, I mean, I guess if they want to go the next step and, and have an order as well, is that- I don't, I, I, you know, it's hard to imagine that Sorry. there's going to be that many people that do that. But the reality is that those, um, until the order, as you know, is, is issued and like goes to the Washington County Sheriff's Department or whatever, somebody right. may, may be able to go in there and get a copy of that record. And so you, so you guys wanted to be sure that as of a, a date certain that somebody could say, I don't have a record, you know, and, and that there would be backed up by that, even if somebody went to the court and said, yeah, but it says right here that you do have a record. So, so the VCIC actually needs that order from the court before it takes it. Yes, yes. VCIC, so that's, that's it. Yeah. So yeah, okay, all right. Yeah, all these agencies need, gotcha. uh, need the order to, to know to destroy all their records. Well, then let me just ask, let me throw a, a, another perhaps problem with this right now then. No, don't so do if, that, Martin. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I have to do that. But so, I mean, for, it's a confusion. So if, if somebody understands that, oh, I can say I don't have a criminal history under D1, 
and then somebody looks on the VCIC or the or the national whatever what's that one called I never can remember the national NCIC NCIC they look on NCIC well wait no there's a record right here at NCIC that seems like that causes certainly confusion and problems I understand that if you search on Google you're going to probably get the information right. anyway once it's off of NCIC but that is a little bit more of a conflict that I'm saying I don't have a criminal record, but I look on NCIC and there's a criminal record right there. So maybe we, we just know, accept it, that. Maybe we accept that. But but I just there could be confusion if we're telling people that you can go to wherever and say you don't have a criminal record, and they may not know that it's still on NCIC and VCIC. So I mean I think I, I hear you. Yes. I mean, you guys were trying to address it so that people wouldn't have to wait for the time, you know, for everything to take the, the understandable amount of time to, to do that. I think what you also have to just always remember here is uh, it's not these things for which, let's say somebody said, I didn't have a record, you know, I don't have a record. And then somebody did get an, get a VCIC, you know, uh, name, date of birth, conviction record, and saw it on there, that offense for which they have a conviction isn't even going to be a crime anymore. So, I, I mean, I guess maybe what the, you know, somebody, if then, then if the employer, whoever went back and said, you do have a record, they say, well, it's not a crime anymore. And here's act, whatever it is that says that I have a legal right to say that I don't because it's not even, it's not criminal anymore. And the legislature has chosen to, you know, to direct the court to expunge all those, all those records. So, so you know, there's. Yeah. I mean, if, if only a person in that situation knew to say all those things that you just said is, is I guess part of the problem, but I, I, I understand. Selena, Selena. Uh, and I think part of it is like a feasing issue of, I mean, maybe I've misunderstood things, but so the, the, maybe the key question is like, when does the court issue the expungement order? Is it, you know, they do all of their work and then they're like, okay, now the record is expunged and then that information goes out to everybody else or can they can they essentially release the order at the start of the process so that the first thing that happens is it gets cleared out from VCIC and then they take the year that they need to to actually do their paperwork but the but the record for all intents and purposes in the in the system is in the place that most employers or housing authorities are going to search for it is gone and maybe that right like if I could just add and that kind of goes to the question I had the other day of how long is it going to take the court to identify those people who fall under this law and can get that order and, and if that's not a very long process then yeah this step one is issue the order send it to VCIC clear that off and then that avoids the confusion I'm talking about but I but we haven't heard from the court yet, but if it's going to take six months for them to identify somebody that puts it, you know, to, in order to issue that order, I think yeah, we definitely need to talk to the court a little bit more, but. We, we have reached out with that question and, and it's, it's unclear. So. I mean, there, I, there could also be like, if, I guess that's a question too, maybe, is does VCIC, if we're saying by law, all misdemeanor marijuana convictions are kind of automatically expunged, does VCIC even have to wait for the court expungement order to remove those records from their system? Or can that just be that, like part, operationalized that they just do that? not a, probably a question for you, Michelle, but to get to Martin's issue. Right. Hmm. Okay, well. Okay, Michelle. Okay, I'm gonna keep moving. So um, bottom of page three, 
subdivision F3 is just a technical change. Again, this language has been kicking around for a few years and it used to say the administrative judge and in that time uh, it's changed to chief to superior judge. So that's just a technical change there. So page four, sub, uh, section B. So this, these are the changes uh, to the, uh, the existing cannabis law and uh, criminal law and the amounts. I did make one change here and um, it's a small but important change. And that is that um, the pre-2013 misdemeanor crime um, was for anything under two ounces. It did not include if you had exactly two ounces. And what I'd had in the Senate version, and this was not a particularly like a Senate choice or whatever, it was just how I drafted it. It swept in the, the two ounces, exactly two ounces into the decrim, um, which I, uh, so then it, it would create this kind of weird situation where you would have, um, you're, you're trying to track and say the, the, the offenses for which you're expunging um, are, you want to decrim that same exact amount. And, I, and it didn't line up with if in the previous version if it was just exactly two ounces. So this um, used to say, if you look at subdivision A to A, it, said, it used to say in the, pre, in the Senate version, unlawfully possess uh, more than two ounces, um, and now it just says two ounces or more. So it's just a slight change there, but um, it is important when you're trying to kind of line those up with the expungement. So I'll take uh, uh, this chance to take you to the chart. If you wanna take a look at that, so you can kind of see the changes. So if you go to the chart, you'll see that as everybody knows you if you have an ounce um, right now that is legal and has been legal for a couple of years um, so that's no change under this proposal um, but under current law if you have uh, more than one ounce but less than two um, it is a criminal uh, offense and the uh, uh, the punishment for that is a six month misdemeanor for first offense and two year for second or subsequent. So the proposed language, because you're gonna when you start to to tweak, you know, and everything, you have to kind of uh, uh, tier it. So this is where you have the civil that is partnered with the expungement. So that if you have more than an ounce but less than two, it's criminal now, but under this proposal, it would go to being a civil offense with the ticketable for $100 for first, 200 for second, and 500 for third or subsequent. Okay, so moving on to the next one, under current law, you have this big range for the three-year felony, which is, Anything that's two ounces up to and including a pound is a three-year felony. And what the proposed language does is it divides it out and kind of cuts that in half. Um, and so two ounces to less than eight would be the six-month misdemeanor and then the two-year misdemeanor for second or subsequent. And then eight ounces up to and including a pound would be the three-year felony. So it kind of, again, kind of trying to create a gradation um, so that as you start to possess more that you gradually go up rather than kind of having a cliff. Um, and then as you, when you get more than that, when you're talking about over a pound, um, then the penalties are the same. So the real differences are just that if you have more than an ounce, but less than two, it will no longer be a misdemeanor. It'll instead be a civil offense. And then with regard to two ounces to less than eight, that'll be a misdemeanor. And right now it's a felony. Anybody have any questions about that?
Okay, I'm gonna skip down to the next one. And I should have highlighted this because it wasn't on your earlier one. But if you look at page seven in, sub, in uh, section C, um, and I don't know if maybe uh, the chair would wanna just address this, but this was a request for a technical change to the existing um, expungement and sealing chapter definitions um, is that uh, when they list the qualifying crime, it's in there that it's a violation of 4230A related to possession, but it doesn't mention cultivation. And as you can see from what we just looked at, the possession um, statutes for cannabis also include cultivation of certain number of plants. And so there was, um, so legal aid and the attorney general's office reached out to the chair to ask if, if you would be willing to consider this technical fix because uh, they said that when they had made their initial recommendations with regard to the expungement law, they meant for it to also include cultivation as part of that reference and it just uh, got left off. Right, thank you. And then I just put this in, Eric will obviously have a much bigger effective date section, but I wanted to put this in there just so you could see that the expungement section and the uh, and this new kind of tweaking of the expungement definition, take those take effect on passage um, so that uh, and then uh, even though the court really, the period is kind of like from January to January, you know, at least gives them some time to gear up. And then uh, section B, which is the, the marijuana penalties that takes effect January 1st. So that's when the decrim would take effect. Okay, uh, great. Thank you, Michelle. Um, Coach, I'll get to you in a second. And so, um, so in terms of the um, internet crimes, that that fix, you have the line. That, I didn't put that in this because I thought we were just talking about expungement. Right. Yeah. But Eric, I, I sent it to Eric, and he'll he'll fold it into the next version of two thirty four. Okay. All right. Yep. Okay. Thanks. I just don't want to lose sight of that. No. 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 Uh, yeah. Coach. Um, Michelle, uh, the question about that cultivation piece. Um, was how does that correlate to the volume uh, numbers that you were talking about? Be the, te the technical fix, right? It would just it just it, it doesn't affect that at all. You have plant numbers in the existing statute and have right. for a long time. Yeah. And so it's just that if somebody falls under that particular okay. subdivision okay. subsection and the plant number, they fall under those plant numbers, okay. they would be eligible to, to expunge for that. Okay, so as long as there was a direct correlation to the existing statute, yes. we were good. Yep. Okay, that, mm -hmm. that was, at first I was going like, wow, somebody get off on, you know, like they had a big old field going or something, you know, but. No, no, the existing one has like, you know, you have this many plants, it's this offense, and yeah. you got a whole bunch, then you're yeah. in the felony range, that kind yep. of thing. Okay, that, I, I was hoping that was the, that's, I just needed clarification. Thank you. Sure. Okay, great. I know, Kimmy, this is a lot of information and we'll get back to this tomorrow, but I wanted to at least have it all out there. Uh, and then I appreciate everybody staying later. Any, uh, any questions? Uh, thank you, Michelle and sure. Eric. Pressing any hands. Great. So um, hopefully, I'm not sure if you're available, Michelle, tomorrow, but we'll check back with you. But um, the, we'll do 119 the first half of tomorrow's uh, committee meeting and hopefully get, um, and then I'd like to get back to S234, cannabis, putting it all into to one bill and, um, and possibly voting on this. So if folks have, have questions, thoughts, you know, please get in touch with me or council. It looks like y'all already booked me for 10, so from 10 to 10.30 tomorrow. So I think we're good. <laughs>
Okay, so I, I have my times wrong. So, okay, so we're not we're not ten thirty, twelve thirty. Okay, I'll uh... maybe, maybe maybe I'm wrong, but I I do have a I do have a meeting notice from ten to ten thirty tomorrow on expungement. Okay, <laughs> we are not. We are. I have us at ten thirty to twelve thirty tomorrow. All right. Okay. Well, maybe whoever does the. I have some flexibility around there, so whoever is doing committee assistance, stuff, just send me when you need me. So send me a meeting notice. Yeah, it would be most likely, you know, 1145 ish or something like that. So, okay. Because we're going to do 119 and 1030. So, okay. All right. Great. Thank you. I'm not seeing any hands. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And so we will now. Martin, Martin had his hand oh. up. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Okay. You're muted, Martin. I hate that. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder, I mean, is it possible for us to do 119 second tomorrow? Because I might not, I'm going to probably be late and I'm hoping to be there for 119. Unless that's already scheduled, that's fine. Then I'll just watch the video later. Yeah, we already have um, Wilden, Bohr, and, um, and Representative Van Donahue. Yep. Okay. So. All right. Fair enough. Yep. Barbara, you look like you're, um, yeah. <laughs> Do we need to get that memo to appropriations? Whoops, yes, thank you. So uh, so I think everybody got it, right? Uh, I think you sent it out to everybody. Yeah, so yeah. I, think, um, I think I think it looks great. If folks have any comments, maybe um, get them to Barbara, Ken, and Coach. But if otherwise, if folks are good with it, I think just, yeah, go ahead and, and send it, Barbara. Thank you. OK. I'll put it in a different, right. I'll try to put it in the format we did last time. I don't know if it goes on our letterhead or. Yeah, um, you know, I think it's, I mean, they asked. Okay. Ask, you know. So you should we give people a time to let me know? Sure, well, we're, uh, what, uh, four o'clock today? Sure. All right, great. All right. Yeah, and Barbara, I think just in an email, it could even be a, a memo within an email, but I, you know, I, I think it's don't sweat over it. Yeah. Great. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everybody. So we're going to go off.